My name is Brynja Kohler, and I'm an Associate Dean here in the College of Science. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to uh, tonight's Science Unwrapped event. I bet some of you have been here before. Maybe. These, um, this series that we've been doing this year um, has been called Building on Basics. And we've learned about a number of basic topics that um, have applications across the sciences. Um, for example, we learned about waves and climate. We learned about chronological order and the fossil record. And then we also learned about radioactivity. So that brings us to tonight. And tonight we'll be talking about rotational forces. Um, and uh, I'll be very happy to introduce our speakers. Um, but I want to make a few acknowledgments to some people that are involved in getting this all together. Um, first of all, our College of Science Dean, Michelle Baker, is here tonight. Do you want to wave to us? There she is. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a Science Unwrapped Committee um, with representatives from various uh, departments in our, in our college. We have Eric Fowler in Computer Science. Brennan Bean in Mathematics and Statistics, Missy Kofed in Chemistry and Biochemistry, Blair Larson in Geology, Boyd Edward in Physics, and our PR specialist for the college, Marianne Maffaletto, who's a science enthusiast in a lot of ways. So thank you very much, Science Unwrapped Committee. Uh, I also want to acknowledge my predecessor in this position, Greg Podgorski, who's joining us tonight. Hi, Greg. It's wonderful to see you. Welcome. And um, yeah, so I have a couple of announcements about how this works. Um, I'll introduce our speakers, and then there's refreshments and booths outside you can visit. We have um, a wide array of volunteers that come and do hands-on activities. Um, in addition to our regular volunteers, tonight we have the Cache Valley Astronomical Society, we have Zuta, and the Cache Pioneer Museum be sure to visit their booths. Also, um, next time, just a couple weeks, February 9th, um, we'll be having our next um, lecture in this series. Uh, Carl Farley, who's a industrial hygienist, will talk about the science of safety. Um, and at that event, we'll be um, the CABUSA, the chemistry club and biochemistry, um, is going to be collecting food items for a food drive. So when you come in a couple of weeks, please remember to bring non-perishable goods and hygiene items. Um, uh, this will benefit the Cash Community Food Pantry. All right. So tonight's speakers, I'm so excited to introduce. Um, First of all, they're making history because they're the first pair of siblings to ever present together. And our program is 15 years old tonight. Um, it's the official 15th birthday. We held our very first presentation in February of 2009. Is there anyone here in the audience who attended the very first presentation? Yay, Mary. And our physics department head, Jan Soika. Nice to see you. All right. Um, we're grateful to tonight's speakers, Boyd and John Edwards, who join a long line of scholars who have volunteered their time and efforts to share the excitement of science learning with us. It's very fitting that the Edwards brothers are here because their family has a distinguished history at Utah State. Their father, USU Professor Emeritus, Professor Farrell Edwards, has pioneered STEM outreach efforts for all ages, contributing to such programs as Utah State's long-running USU Physics Day at Lagoon. We're very honored to have Professor Edwards here this evening, and we'd love for you to stand to be recognized. Thank you. Tonight, you get to experience not only the Edwards family's storied enthusiasm for science, but their hilarious humor and theatrical antics. 
These are a family who love the theater <laughs> and performance and singing and all kinds of activities. Uh, Boyd, the older of the two brothers, is a Logan native and professor in USU's Department of Statistics. He's also a graduate of Utah State where he earned bachelor's and master's degrees in physics. He continued his education at Stanford University where he earned a doctoral degree in applied physics. Following graduation from Stanford, he completed a postdoctoral research appointment at Sandia National Laboratories. An award-winning teacher, he taught physics at West Virginia University for 24 years, where he held the Russell and Ro Ruth Bolton Professorship for Excellence in Teaching. He served for five years as dean of USU's Uinta Basin campus in Vernal, which quickly grew under his leadership. And we're now privileged to have him as a professor here in Logan. Boyd says, as a theorist in nonlinear dynamics, fluid physics, and statistical physics, he sees the beauty in mathematics that describe our universe. John Edwards is an assistant professor in USU's Department of Computer Science. He's also a graduate of Utah State, having earned a bachelor's degree in computer science. Following USU, John took a professional route working in industry as a software and research engineer in high-performance graphics applications. During this career, he earned a master's degree in computer science from BYU. Subsequently, John earned a doctoral degree from the University of Texas, where his research focused on nanoscale geometric modeling of hippocampal brain neurons. After a postdoctoral appointment, at the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute at the University of Utah, John started an independent research career at Idaho State University, and after three years, was invited to, it, to join our faculty at Utah State. Both John and Boyd are recipients of national research funding, including a recent National Science Foundation grant funding, a collaborative visualization project in which both brothers are involved. That focuses on physics simulation. Both brothers love the outdoors, music, exploring science, and having fun while pursuing all of those things. They have built the USU Coriolis Carousel, which you'll get to experience tonight. So sit back and enjoy the fun. Welcome to Rotational Forces Riding the Coriolis Carousel. Or, How to Avoid Death by Centrifuge. <laughs> My name is Boyd Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Now, you may have noticed that we have the same last name, but that is entirely coincidental. Except that we are brothers. Have been for a long time. This is Gaspar Gustave du Coriolis. Gaspard Gustave de Coriolis. You totally made that up. No, actually, he was a French scientist that lived in the 1800s. French scientist, huh? What did he study? He's best known for his work on forces in rotating frames of reference. Forces in rotating frames of reference. Now that he totally made up. No, actually, these forces are very important. Oh, they're important, huh? How are they important? Because they can kill you. You want me? Mr. Drax says to telephone him. All right, I'll call him from my office. You go ahead. I'll be right back. The instructor will supervise the session. Enjoy yourself. Yes. We're taking good care of him.
Okay, that was, that was pretty cool. But what does James Bond have to do with forces and rotating frames of reference? Because in that clip, James Bond experienced the centrifugal force. It's the outward force experience that's produced by a rotating centrifuge. Oh, right. Like in my car, I take a tight turn and it kind of pushes me to the outside. Yeah, exactly. I got it. That's centrifugal. I got it. But frames of reference? What does that have to do with anything? So let me give you an example of a frame, frame of reference. Uh, how big does that door up there appear to you? That door? Yeah, up there. Mm, about that big. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Now run up there and tell me how big it appears from up there. Why? Just do it. Holy Toledo, it's like this big! <laughs> Seriously! That's because you're in a different frame of reference. The world appears different depending on your frame of reference. Really? Yeah. That's cool. This frame of reference, little. That frame of reference is... Exactly. But there was nothing rotating there. Yeah, let me give you an example of a rotating frame of reference. Um, what do you hot. see out here, John? I see some really nice people. I see Olivia, hey! It's good to see ya. Hi, Heather. What are they doing? They're mostly sitting and listening politely. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, very well done. Are they moving? No, no, not really. Okay, now, spin around. Spin around. Yeah, spin around and tell me what you see. Move faster. All right. All right. Move faster, just like James Bond. Well done. Okay, so now what do you see? Hey, wait. Everybody's moving. They're like, they're like moving around me. That's because you're in a rotating frame of reference. You see the world differently in a rotating frame of reference. But in my stationary frame of reference, all of them are sitting here quietly uh, behaving themselves. They're not moving at all. Okay, that is really, really cool. But, you know, James Bond... Yeah, well, James Bond experienced the centrifugal force because he was in a rotating frame of reference. But the evil centrifuge operator didn't experience that force because he was in a stationary frame of reference. Centrifugal force, huh? Centrifugal, yeah. Centrif hey, wait. My high school physics teacher said that centrifugal force wasn't real. She said it was a fictitious force. That's because she was teaching you to apply Newton's second law, F equals MA, in a stationary frame of reference. But if you apply Newton's second law in a rotating frame of reference, you have to include the centrifugal force or you get the wrong answer. Huh. Yeah. Man, I wish my physics teacher were here to get a load of this right now. How do you like my centrifuge, Mr. Bond? <laughs> when I pull this lever, the centrifugal force will crush every bone in your body. Ha! You mean centripetal force. There's no such thing as centrifugal force. A laughable claim, Mr. Bond, perpetuated by overzealous teachers of science. When you construct, simply construct Newton's laws in a rotating system, and the centrifugal force term appears plain as day. Come now. Do you really expect me to do coordinate substitution in my head while strapped to a centrifuge? No, Mr. Bond. I expect you to die. <laughs> Okay, so you've convinced me, James Bond, centrifugal force, yeah. But, you know, you started this whole thing with some Coriolis fella, and you haven't talked about him at all. Yeah, Coriolis was a bright guy. He described two forces that are experienced in rotating frames of reference. The first is the centrifugal force, the one that James Bond experienced. The other one is called the Coriolis force, named after him, and it's a force, force that pulls you to one side or the other. Wait. So the centrifugal force pushes you out, mm -hmm. and the Coriolis force pushes you to the side? Yep, yep, exactly. 
And we can. Can you show that to me? We can demonstrate that using the USU Coriolis Carousel. And we'd like to <laughs> like to invite our amazing riders, Jocelyn, Isabel, Aiden, and Olivia, and our amazing pushers, Paul, Jack, and Dane. So what we're going to demonstrate first is the centrifugal force. It's one that we're familiar with, but I want uh, them to experience it uh, for us. So I'd like to have our pushers rotate them counterclockwise. All right, let's stop the carousel. And I want to ask, is, I want to ask Olivia if she experienced the centrifugal force. I did. And what did that force do to you? It pulled me back. It kind of pushed you back against your seat? Yes. And exactly. And that's exactly what we've all felt when we turn uh, a corner in our car. Well done, Olivia. Thank you. Now we're going to demonstrate the Coriolis force using this ball. The Coriolis force requires movement within the rotating frame of reference. We're going to have Jocelyn a practice passing the ball to Olivia, straight over to Olivia, and now Olivia back to Jocelyn. All right, now, now what we're going to do is rotate the carousel counterclockwise and then see what happens when Jocelyn throws the ball. And I'll tell you when to throw it, Jocelyn. We only want just one throw. Okay, Jocelyn, throw the ball to Olivia. Okay, let's stop the carousel. Well done. Okay, Jocelyn, um, Jocelyn, what happened when you... Wait a minute. First of all, did you throw the ball straight at Olivia? Yes. You threw it straight? Yes. But the ball didn't go straight. She moved. <laughs> exactly right. While the ball was in the air, Olivia moved out of the way. And so all bets were off. So what we're going to do now is allow you to take a peek into this rotational frame, this rotating frame of reference. And we'll use this uh, camera that's located right here, looking down on the carousel. And on the screen will be shown the view from this camera. And we'll have, we'll rotate the carousel again counterclockwise and have the kids pa pass this ball a few times to each other. So what I want you to be looking for is when they pass the ball, does the ball go straight? Does it curve to the thrower's right? Or does it curve to the thrower's left? Okay, go ahead. Excellent. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Okay. All right, let's stop the carousel. Well done. What did you, s yeah, well done. So what did you see? Ball goes straight to the right or to the left? Yes. It went to the right. It went to the thrower's right. Well done. What's your name? Mason? Well done, Mason. Hey, Boyd. I'm over here. Oh, yeah. Hi, John. So me and Olivia are here talking. Uh-huh. Kind of wondering, what would happen if you went the other direction? Well, that's a very good question. We were rotating counterclockwise here, and you're asking about us rotating clockwise? Yeah, well, that's right, Olivia, right? It was her Olivia, idea, and not mine. Want? Is that what you want, Olivia? Okay, so folks, what do you, Olivia, what do you think is going to happen? It went to the right when we were going counterclockwise. What do you expect? What do you predict is going to happen? I have a hunch that it will go to the left. Olivia, let's test your hunch. Let's go clockwise. We're going to see what kind of a scientist Olivia is. Anytime. Okay, well done. Let's stop the carousel. Well done. Yeah. So. So how did Olivia do? Did she get it right or not? Yeah. It bent to the left. Yeah, exactly right. Hey, Boyd. Where are you now? I'm up here. 
Wow. I'm here with Will. Hi, Will. Yeah, so we're having an argument. Okay. So, I think it's fake. He says it's real. I think it's a fake force. Like, the, the ball's curving, yeah, but the ro camera's rotating. It's not a real force. It's, there's nothing pushing the ball to the side. You think the, you But think Will doesn't think so. He thinks it's real. Real you know, Will. I think it's fake, and Will thinks it's real. I see. Yeah. Well, let's do an experiment then to, to solve this dilemma between the two of you. What we're going to do is replace the ball with dumbbells. Okay. <laughs> no, they're not going to throw them. They're not going to throw them. <laughs> what we're going to do is they're going to start with the dumbbells in the center of their chests and then push the dumbbell out fast. On the count of three, do it. One, two, three. I want you to push it out fast. Good. Now we're going to rotate the carousel and see what happens. Counterclockwise. And you guys can watch what happens in the overhead camera. On the count of three. One, two, three. Okay, bring it back in. <laughs> bring it back in and do it one more time. One, two, three. Okay. okay Isabel's seatbelt's off. Okay, let's get that back on there, Isabel. All right, well done. Um, so, so uh, let's see. Isabel, can you tell me what, if there was any difference between what happened when you pushed the dumbbell out when you were not rotating versus when you were rotating? Well, when I pushed the dumbbell out, when I pushed the dumbbell out, when it was not rotating, it just like, like it just stayed put. Straight. And, yeah, and yeah. it was straight. And when I, when it was rotating, it went to the right. It went to the right. Yeah. Did you feel it pulling to the, pulling your arm to yeah. the right? Yeah. Probably. Okay. <laughs> All right. um, yeah. Was the force real or imaginary? I I felt the force. Okay, so is Will or John right on that one? How many vote for Will? I vote for Will. Yeah. Yeah, Will wins that one. It was a real force. Well done. Can you all give our helpers a hand, please? So, Boyd, that was really cool. I mean, it, it was pretty awesome. So are you convinced that that force is real now? You, maybe you'll have to ride the carousel. Yeah. Can I ride it after? You bet. Sweet. Sure. Okay, so I, I would like that to be convinced because maybe they're acting. But, you know, merry-go-rounds, you just don't see them anymore. They're kind of a liability. And... Where is this applicable anywhere besides the Coriolis carousel? Like, is there real life importance to all this? Great question. And I'll ask you a question. We are right here no. standing. Centrifugal. Car. What? Car. Car. Oh, yeah, for sure. The, uh, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of applicability to this force. Uh, the centrifugal force, it's important to account for that force in car design to minimize the risk of the car flipping over when you take a tight turn. And uh, it's also important in road design. NASCAR tracks are banked to keep those cars on the track. The Coriolis, the centrifugal force, is responsible for the Earth's equatorial bulge. Some of us have a little bit of an equatorial bulge. <laughs> but the Earth has one, too. And because of that, the top of Mount Chimborazo, which is near the equator, is farther from the center of the Earth than the top of Mount Everest. Wait. Wait, you said yeah. the top of Mount Chimbo whatever. Yeah is farther from the center of the Earth than Mount Everest? Yeah. I've totally been cheated. My Everest expedition was a farce. <laughs> uh, 
you never want to have this. <laughs> um, a couple other examples. Fighter pilots need to be careful not to pull out of a dive too quickly or they can pass out from the centrifugal force called the G-force. And then finally, a little closer to home, the centrifugal force is responsible for wringing the water out of your clothes in your washing machine spin cycle. Now wait a second. You said there are two forces in rotating frames of reference. One's the centrifugal force that pushes out. One's the Coriolis force that we saw that pushes to the right. All you've been talking about is centrifugal force. That's Coriolis right. is unimportant. Well, uh, yeah, great, great question. Let me talk about that. We are right here standing on something that's rotating. We're standing on something that's ro rotating? Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, well, the floor isn't rotating, and this room certainly isn't rotating, and campus, no, Utah isn't rotating. North America is... I, 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 think, I think he's having a little trouble. Maybe could somebody help him? The Earth! The Earth! The Earth, the earth is rotating! You got Bam. that all on your own. Well done. <laughs> yeah, the Earth Thanks is rotating. And we're all in a rotating frame of reference. We're all in this together, folks. <laughs> exactly. So the Earth rotates toward the east. And if you move around so you're above the North Pole, looking down on the rotating Earth, you see that it rotates in what direction? Counterclockwise. So objects moving in the Northern Hemisphere experience a Coriolis force to the right, for the same reason that the riders on the carousel experienced a Coriolis force to the right when it rotated counterclockwise. These form what are known as inertia circles, and they've been observed in ocean currents. So now, if we look at the Earth from the perspective below, or above, whatever your perspective is, above the South Pole, what direction does the Earth rotate? It's clockwise now. The frame of reference is important here. So this, in this clockwise rotating frame, objects veer to the left, just like happened on the Coriolis carousel. So the inertia circles um, veer, uh, rot uh, get, get veer, get curved toward the left. Okay, that's, that's pretty cool, and I'm confident that this demo was done with software that was written by a brilliant computer scientist. <laughs> but um, It was him. You know, I, <laughs> I've seen a washing machine, I've seen a car, you know, curve, and I felt that. I have never, ever in my life seen something deflected by the Coriolis force caused by the rotation of the Earth. Yeah, that's because the Earth's 24-hour rotation is so slow compared to the fast rotation of this carousel. Because of that, the Coriolis force is 20,000 times weaker on the surface of the Earth due to the Earth's rotation compared with the, the carousel. 20,000 times weaker? Yeah. Right? Weak forces, it's totally irrelevant. Are you frustrated? Yes! <laughs> Sorry to hear it. Uh, let me show you something. When a low pressure region develops in the atmosphere, air rushes in and experiences the Coriolis force. And this is what you get. All right. Still frustrated? It's relevant. It's exactly right. This hurricane that you showed, um, it was rotating counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, would a hurricane rotate clockwise? Um, our expert, forgot your name. Olivia, what do you think, Olivia? You think that the hurricanes are going to rotate the opposite direction in the southern hemisphere? Yes, and she's right. The uh, down, down under, 
hurricanes are called cyclones or tropical cyclones, and they rotate clockwise. So every hurricane in the northern hemisphere counterclockwise, and every single one in the southern hemisphere is clockwise. Very predictable, very consistent. So you know what I heard? I heard that if, if you have a sink, you know how you turn the water on and it swirls down the drain? Uh huh. I heard that it swirls a different direction in the southern hemisphere than here because of the Coriolis force. Is that right? No. The motion of water swirling down a drain is very inconsistent and unpredictable. The Coriolis force is there, but it's extremely tiny. It's a tiny, tiny effect. And it's, it, it's tiny because the distances and the velocities are so small. So, sorry about that. Oh. Well then, this next thing, I, I hate to even bring it up, because it, it's kind of ridiculous. But, you know, I, I heard that um, sharpshooters shooting a gun, if they shoot long distances, that the Coriolis force actually bends, sorry, it bends the bullet, and they have to account for that? That's ridiculous. Actually, yeah. Uh, long distance shooters it have to account for the Coriolis force. It can deflect that bullet by several inches. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it can. That's why I never get a bullseye. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, exp that explains it. So, Boyd, this Coriolis carousel thing's pretty cool. Can anybody ride it? Yeah. Anyone who's four foot six or above is welcome to write it after we have uh, questions. So afterwards, um, we're going to finish up here. Be sure to check out the booths in the back and the refreshments. And please come back on February 9th, where Carl Farley will talk about the science of cleanliness, I think, which should be absolutely and completely awesome. We're going to take questions down here. If you'd like to come, just come up to Boyd, because he has all the answers, as we know. And I'm going to run Coriolis um, carousel demonstrations, so come on up if you'd like, and we'll give you a safety briefing, and you can give it a shot. Now, wait, well, I got one more question, Boyd. How strong are the forces going to be if they ride this thing? I will crush every bone in their bodies. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll have someone else at the controls. Thank you for coming.